The central bank yesterday announced a raft of bold and progressive as well as a few controversial measures to immediately stabilize the foreign exchange and financial system, thereby giving a fillip to the COVID pandemic impacted economy in the short term. The policy prescription including new directives as well as requests to the government was revealed via the central bank's six-month road map for ensuring macroeconomic and financial system stability. The new measures will bring in greater stability to the economy with stable prices and sound macroeconomic fundamentals that will lead to a stronger and a disciplined economy, Central Bank Governor Nivard Cabral said yesterday after unveiling the road map, which was his brainchild when he served in the same capacity between 2006 and 2015. He described the road map unveiled as the first step in a long journey and given the COVID pandemic caused challenges, there was a need for multiple interventions with burden or the responsibility to be shared by all stakeholders. In times of stress, we need discipline rather than rocking the boat. If not, we all will capsize. Therefore, all stakeholders need to understand their role and responsibility, Cabral said. We all know that Sri Lanka was once graciously referred to as the wonder of Asia. We st it still is in my view. And we also expect miracles from our country. And I still believe it is possible to believe in miracles and to go forward. And I believe that is what we are hoping to instill in ourselves a discipline where we can really reach out to that future that we are preparing for ourselves. We all know that there is a fear about the current economic challenges. And there is reason to believe as well that there could be tensions. And I think that's part of this entire understanding of the situation. There has been sluggish growth, COVID pandemic, increase in non-performing loans, increase in central bank's treasury bill holdings, the reduction in the reserves, increase in uh, remittance flows, uh, increase in unauthorized remittance flows, stockpiling of imported goods, hostile international media reports, shortage of foreign currency, uh, sharp depreciation of the rupee, concerns expressed regularly about debt sustainability, weakened revenues, unfavorable sovereign ratings, concerned consumers, SMEs having concerns, deterioration of confidence, all that is, I think, a reflection of the underlying situation in the country. Not only for us, I think it's there for all over, lots of countries in the world. We, the last time we checked, we found that because of the COVID pandemic and other resultant issues, about 123 countries had been downgraded. So we are all going through a journey which is difficult. In addition, of course, we do hear doomsday reports Quite a number of them are seen regularly. I also happen to read those carefully to see whether there is any merit in those. Sometimes there are some useful parts in those, sometimes not. But that's the world that we are living in. And everyone gets across their message in some way or the other. Uh, there is enough uh, opportunities to do that. So I think that's another part of the equation as we go along. Let's have a quick look at the situation where we were a few years ago and where we are now. Let's look at 2014, where our economy was in the region of about nearly $80 billion. Now also we are in the same range. And then it was like coming home to a time that has not changed. The GDP especially was about $80 billion when I left. And when I came back also it was around the same number. So obviously it was a little discomforting, but at the same time comforting, because it was as if there has been no change at all. But that's part of the whole equation. Not, not only for us, I think it has been for the whole world, there has been a general reduction, which means now we've got to work hard at that. We found that the GDP per capita has also come down a little bit. Merchandise exports are pretty much at similar levels as 2014, and so has so many other Macro fundamentals also remain at reasonably constant levels, although a few have deteriorated as well. The weakened economy, along with the effect of COVID-19, has caused anxiety, as we all know, and that's 
the new challenge that we are now facing. The economy grew by 8% in the first half, which was commendable. Had we not been able to record that kind of a growth, it would have been that we are officially in recession. So fortunately, we didn't have to do that. Although on a low base, Sri Lanka did have an improvement in its, uh, in its uh, growth. And we found that even the sectors concerned have also been gradually improving, which gives us some comfort that there is an underlying situation within the entire economy that gives us hope that we can move forward with a lot more confidence. The external sector in particular has had some serious challenges and uh, there has been more than the challenge itself, the regular commentary that uh, suggests that the challenge is insurmountable. A lot of times I hear comments that we should approach different agencies. But if you just look at the situation from 2019 and onwards, Sri Lanka had reserves of 7.6 billion at the end of 2019. Thereafter, notwithstanding what a lot of people have been saying, we have paid back 6 billion in the year 2020. Then we paid back a further 5.6 billion in 2021 so far. And we are now with a reserve of around 5 billion, which is consisting of 3.5 billion in cash and a swap arrangement that we have for another 1.5 billion. So technically that shouldn't have been possible if you're only looking at the reserve and doing our calculations to say, look, we are unable to pay. Now that's lots of times what happens. People look at the reserve, then they do a little arithmetic, forget that there are inflows that are due to come, and then they come to the conclusion that here is a country that is going to have trouble. So they extend it to 2029, and they will say that there is a amount of $29 billion due, and how are these people going to pay when they have only $5 billion? In that case, that situation would have been a lot worse today. So what it tells us is that you got to understand reserve management is not only dealing with the reserves that we have, but dealing with the inflows as well. Making sure that inflows come in at the right time. None of the companies that you're talking about as being guilt-edged companies would be in a position to pay back all their loans in one shot. That's why you have balance sheets which has current liabilities, current uh, assets, long-term assets, long-term liabilities. So those are all balanced in such a way that we can move forward. So I can assure you that this criticism that sometimes arises that Sri Lanka will face difficulties is misplaced because we have already shown in the last two years that it can be done and we, you can be sure that even in the next few years it will be done in the same way. The budget deficit has of course increased. There has been a reason for that the pandemic itself has absorbed nearly 200 billion rupees of uh, additional expenditure which the government had to meet and if not for that fact we would have been not having this uh, situation today. So that kind of expenditure has to be provided for. And with all that, we have still been able to maintain inflation at broad, comfortable levels, although there has been some tension there as well. And the amount of money supply has also had to be increased for good measure. Again, that has happened in so many other countries as well. Many countries have uh, responded to the pandemic with that kind of a reaction, which is important. We have also seen, when quantified, that the support that has been given by the government to deal with the pandemic, as well as the central bank to deal with the pandemic, has been very, very impressive. A lot of people have not appreciated that, and sometimes uh, the few months that I was in parliament, I realized that um, that had not been sufficiently explained as to what kind of a support has already been given. And I believe it's necessary for us to appreciate that there has been a huge amount of work that has been done as well. The COVID Saubagi scheme that has been provided by the central bank at very low interest rates in order to support 
the industries as well as the SMEs as well as businesses has been a very large 165 billion rupees. That's about 1.1% of GDP. The support to the government has been around 2,002 billion rupees. The savings of the private sector as a result of the reduced interest amounts to 365 billion. So sometimes when you see uh, very impressive uh, bottom lines being shown by some companies, although there would have been a lot of work done by those companies themselves, a part of it has pro been provided by my predecessor, Professor Lakshman, who has been the man who had made the interest rates low enough for those profits to be made. So I believe that's another important recognition that we should sometimes appreciate as well. At the same time, the government has also benefited with the low interest uh, regime that was maintained, 313 billion. Now I'm saying that to make it known that the low interest regime is a very important factor if we are to make our businesses a lot more viable than what we have today. So sometimes in times of stress, it may not be able, possible to keep it at those levels. That is why all need to cooperate so that we can maintain it at those levels, at reasonable levels, so that both lenders and borrowers could benefit by a situation of that nature. The monetary policy easing measures have been also very helpful. The extended debt moratoria, which the government uh, as well as the central bank uh, put together, was an important factor in order, in order to ensure that businesses survived these difficult times. And of course, we have all seen the proactive vaccination measures, the uh, fiscal stimuli that was being given by the government, the tax exemptions, a lot of other uh, areas where a lot of work had been done in order to provide the system with a certain degree of stability. The vaccination program is over here, and I think uh, we have a very good uh, outcome that has happened there. And what does it take, where does it take to uh, us now? I believe we got to appreciate again that we have faced tough challenges in the past. Of course, we can begin with 1505 to 1948, 443 years of uh, foreign domination. And we came up, notwithstanding what some people might say, we had just one university in 1948. So after 443 years of uh, for in domination, we had one university, all those, those countries that dominated us had a lot more universities than that. We today have 17 state universities and about 46 universities of the private sector. So we have come a long way. Only 1% of the people had electricity and water in 1948. Today, nearly 99.9% .9 of the people have electricity. 43% of people have water on tap. And in the next four to five years, we would ensure that about 85% of the people would have water on tap. So those are the factors that we have been able to generate in the last 73 years. We have gone through a three-decade conflict, two insurrections, power and energy crisis, droughts, pandemics, tsunamis, double-digit inflation, depletion of foreign reserves in the past, so many different types of struggles that we have had, but we have come out on top always. So what are we hoping to do today? We are trying to see how we are going to give clarity to the economy. And clarity doesn't come with one intervention alone. It has to come from several interventions, and the burden should be shared by all stakeholders. If it is just one stakeholder who is putting their hand up and going to be the one who would uh, deal with the situation, I don't think it would work. It has to be a shared approach. It's like all of us are going in a boat in stormy seas. We all have to go in a certain disciplined manner. We have to move forward without rocking the boat, especially in times of turbulence. If we don't do that and we don't have a journey which is methodical and which is done in a proper manner, it is likely that the boat would capsize. So if you want to keep the boat heading in the right direction and moving in the right direction, we got to all understand 
what the role of each stakeholder should be, and we should accordingly move forward. So I've just put down, we have, we have worked out the different uh, sectors, government, banking sector, people, central bank, importers, exporters, capital and debt markets, sovereign rating agencies, exchange houses, service exporters, investors, development partners, all of them will need to move together in a cohesive pattern. The central bank is the agency that has been entrusted with the responsibility of delivering economic and price stability, as well as financial system stability. It sounds simple, but the reason why the society has provided that entire responsibility to an institution is because they know it is important for that institution to deliver that for the country. It is only when you don't have stability that you realize what stability is. If you don't have stability of the foreign exchange rate at which this rupee trades, then you realize that it is not easy for you to do your businesses. If you do not know what the next year is going to bring, then your business will also be affected. So you need a comfort that there is a stable environment, and that is what the central bank is expected to do by law, and that is why the central bank intends to do, because that is our duty and responsibility by the country, by the people of this country, to deliver that stability. So today's plan that is unfolded would be addressing that very important factor that we are providing the stability for the markets as well as to everyone. So our plan would be in overall plan, although we are only focusing on the number one, will be a six month plan, which is what we are going to do today, and then a one year horizon, and then a medium to long term uh, uh, plan. The first is, the first six months is, is immediate stabilization. We ought to have stability. The second is consolidation. And the third is building the cushions to be able to absorb any shocks for the future. It's like a 50-over match, and within the first 10 overs, you have lost four wickets, not very many runs on the board, then you've got to stabilize. If the number five and number six batsmen get onto the crease and start hitting out, I don't think the match will be won. So you've got to first stabilize, make sure that you have the necessary wickets in hand so that you can approach the rest of the overs with a lot more confidence. Then you consolidate, where you score a few runs so that the target doesn't become too, too high. And at the same time, you are amassing the strength to move into the next phase. The third phase would be a lot more comfortable, but at the same time, there will be risks there as well. And then you've got to ensure that you have the necessary cushions, so your eye must be in so that you can hit the ball well. And that's part of the strategy of a good cricket team. So if you follow that, I think this match could also be won. The central bank will take immediate steps to ensure stability, and the proper management of this period will result in clarity and certainty. Thereafter, we envisage the foreign exchange direct investments to come. We envisage tourism to improve. We envisage the other factors that have, the building blocks that have been put in place, particularly the pharmaceutical industry, the monetization of certain underutilized assets. All those will kick in a lot more strongly, and then Sri Lanka will be able to move forward with a lot more clarity. So the new efforts will demand moderate contributions from all stakeholders, the government, the central bank, the banking sector, merchandise and service exporters, importers, retailers, and the global Sri Lankans as main stakeholders, but there'll be others also who will have to play their part. We know the problem. That's why we went through this uh, long discourse, so, because sometimes some people believe that we don't know the problem. And they tell us uh, this is the problem. Yes, we also know that there is a problem. But now it is our turn to find the solutions, and that's why some of those problems are significant. There's pressure on the fiscal operations, there's accumulation of external debt, and the debt raised through ISPs has been somewhat 
large that could lead us to some vulnerabilities. The pandemic has affected certain huge parts of our economy. Rating downgrades had aggravated the situation. The confidence on the debt servicing on some basis because we were able to pay back two of the main uh, debts outstanding, $2 billion, without any deferment at all, and we don't intend to do any deferment even in the future, has brought in some confidence, and high yields uh, in the market sometimes can be a little disturbing as well. Sovereign ratings have come down uh, from where we were some time ago, but we are confident that once these are put in place and they see results, then Sri Lanka will be able to go on a trajectory which is on the upward trend. The banking sector has been resilient, but we need to deal with a few issues. That will be something that we are discussing today. The non-banking sector also has seen some difficulties. There has been some uh, finance companies that have failed. Those need to be also uh, addressed because there are lots of uh, stakeholders that have been affected by that. The implementation of the consolidation program is another area which we need to be addressing our minds. And the, in the case of exporters, we find that the goods flow has taken place, and that's duly recorded as exports. But the corresponding amounts that need to come in as cash flows have not materialized at the same levels. Now, our research departments have access to all this information, and there's no need or reason for them to make any other uh, reports on these matters. I have seen a few people getting a little excited that they are not hoarding any dollars, but they are actually uh, repatriating and converting. That's what we really want. So if that is being done, there's absolutely no issue, and we are all on the same page. It is only those who have not done that, there is a concern, because that export actually becomes an export only once it is realized in rupees in this country. So there is a need for some instances for exports to have corresponding imports, which we recognize. And from the uh, areas that we are going to talk to you about today, you would see that we have addressed that as well, perfectly in order, and we have to uh, uh, provide for that. But at the same time, we, export, we expect the exports to materialize as converted rupees, because that is where the whole exercise is there. So we expect that to happen, and we need to take a few steps to ensure that it happens. In many, many countries, that happens. So we have sometimes borrowed technical expertise from those countries to understand how those countries are also dealing with it, and we would be dealing with that today as well. A few pressures have built up in the case of importers and exporters, mainly because of speculative reasons. We all know that when there is uncertainty, people provide for the worst, and that's a human tendency. You expect the worst. So if you expect the worst, if you feel that the rupee is depreciating, you would depreciate it to the worst number that you feel that uh, it will go to. And when you do that, then you will provide for your selling price based on that too. So all those factors kick in, and that's why we have to make sure that that uncertainty is removed as quickly as possible. Service exporters, other than tourism, have also been affected. Industrialists have uh, faced challenges. Money changers especially have uh, lost their businesses, mainly because there was nothing much for them to in cash when there was no tourism. Retailers and wholesalers have also been affected, although the uh, food inflation has been at reasonable levels. I'm not saying at satisfactory levels, but it should be uh, brought down further. Workers' remittances have also been affected in the past few months, uh, particularly because of the fact that there was a dual exchange rate prevailing, and that helped them to go and get it uh, outside the normal course of uh, the banking sector. And also there was a reduction in the number of people who could go abroad, and that was another factor. Stocks and shares, the securities uh, exchange would know that in the last few months, the stock exchange has been going forward well, but at the same time, the foreign holdings of both the government securities as well as equities have been dropping. At the same time, 
uh, that gives us the feeling as well as the uh, opportunity that it could go up to that le level provided we get our factors right, particularly the uh, government securities. I remember at the end of 2014, we had $3,489 million. We have $9 million now, but that doesn't matter. We have to consider that space and we are working on that now and we are confident that that would soon be reversed and there would be a positive flow coming in. So would it be for the equities? The Securities and Exchange Act was passed just a few days, uh, months ago, which meant that uh, the long felt need of new legislation has also occurred and we are on the right track there. The central bank has also faced a few challenges, depreciation, de depletion of uh, foreign reserves and the pressure, but we believe that those also could be addressed with the plan that we are going to put in place. The exchange rate impact on the central government's debt is another factor that we must all be conscious of because the rupee depreciation uh, can be very uh, a huge burden if you do have the uh, debt in US dollars as well. If you have foreign debt, any depreciation of the currency could affect the total composition of the debt and that is something that we must all be concerned about and that is why the central bank takes the necessary steps to ensure that we bring stability. The people have faced challenges too, uh, although several government policies have been helpful. The GDP loss has been addressed now, it's being addressed and the allocations by government about 200 and uh, more than 200 billion rupees has also been stated and uh, the lockdown has definitely affected us as a whole. So now we are hoping to suggest to you what the, or to tell you what the to-do list is. It's, it's going to be a simple to-do list that each one will have to do. And that will help Sri Lanka to reset its course. Not too much, but a fairly clear reset, which will help us to go through the next six months without any undue additional worry or pain. So the critical issues that we have will concern the debt and forex concerns. I think that is where a lot of people have certain uh, concerns and we need to address that. The financial sector concerns, the macroeconomic stability concerns, the stipulated periods, convert the repatriated export proceeds into LKR after deducting the permitted amounts of forex for the intermediate and investment inputs. So it's a very comfortable arrangement for them as well. Convert the export proceeds already accumulated, uh, which were brought in by way of exports uh, in accordance with the central bank's directions. And we expect that to happen in the next six months on a staggered basis to ensure that there would be uh, a, a rollout which is not in any way affecting the smooth flow of capital as well. They ex expand the export businesses, lay the foundation for more value-added businesses, attract foreign investments, as well as promote branding of Sri Lanka. I also want to make a very clear statement here that no changes whatsoever will be made to the personal foreign currency accounts. Those were previously referred to as NRFC and RFC. There is no change whatsoever to those accounts. We also have services exports, particularly the ICT, as well as the global uh, presence uh, should provide them with the space to improve that. And they too will need to repatriate and convert their proceeds because then only the final export will culminate. And with the resumption of tourism, we want all those who are involved in the tourism sector to prepare themselves for that new advent of tourists as well. So it's important that you have the, your plant done up and uh, we believe that the efforts of the government will be then supported by you if you are ready to accept tourists as soon as it opens up. Importers, we would like to make a special appeal to them not to stockpile additional inventories. Sometimes the concern is that because of difficulties that we may not be able to import what we want, so therefore we'll import early. We want to assure them there would be sufficient foreign exchange and reserves available for them and we would like them to make sure that their imports are done in such a way that they don't need to stockpile unnecessarily. We are 
today removing the cash margin requirements on the non-essential and non-urgent imports that will be lifted from today. Uh, but we request and invite the importers to act responsibly and only import what is necessary as well as their requirements and unnecessarily not to build up their inventories as we go along. The industries and property dealers, particularly those who are importing steel, cement, and such, uh, such uh, industrial equipment, not to stockpile, but to move forward with the current conditions without having, to, having any panic buying as well. Utilize the dedicated industrial zones, expand your campaigns, and make use of the current uh, uh, resident and long-term visa incentives to attract more and more people to come into the country. Forex houses, we also ask them to, um, uh, to ensure that they act in a responsible manner. And we are restoring all the licenses of those who had been cancelled uh, in the recent past because they were unable to make their targets and we will be restoring all those licenses. Those who are remitting money from outside, we are asking them to make use of the official channels. All the banks have now prepared methods by which monies can be remitted very, very easily and conveniently. So we are requesting all those who are making use of these facilities to convert, uh, to send money into Sri Lanka to make use of those channels. The share market and the corporate debt market now also has a massive opportunity to regain some of the foreign investors that had left the country. And we would like you to make special road shows as well as other uh, ways in which you can make it known to all those investors that Sri Lanka is back in business and Sri Lanka would like to have their investments back again. So that's another message that we would like to give to the world and we hope that you will take that message as well. Let's now deal with the financial sector concerns. Firstly, the government, we would like the government to support and continue to support, they have already been, always been supporting the consolidation effort of the financial sector. This sector had been for some time spoken of, but unfortunately it had not been uh, moving at the right pace. But we would like to see that the non-banking sector consolidation occurs in the next few months. We want to see also the state-owned business enterprises uh, diversifying their borrowing sources. Sometimes their borrowing sources have been confined to only the state banks or to others of that nature. But I believe it's, the time is now necessary for them to diversify so that they can also be a lot more competitive and the opportunities available to the private banks could also increase as time goes on. Uh, we also would like to see them taking business decisions so that when they are taking those decisions, they take into fa the factors of the profitability as well as the going concern as well as supportive of the normal businesses in a business sense are also considered carefully. The central bank would also uh, provide support as well as do certain uh, actions in the next six months. First of all, we want to see that the moratoria is unwinded gradually, not a sudden way. It has to be a soft landing. So we want to make sure that uh, the lockdown effect, because it is being felt by so many businesses, that the central bank will advise the financial sy system as well as the sector to indulge in that in a gradual fashion. And we would also provide liquidity because we find that a lot of the businesses have, will now have to pay the old loans plus the old interest, the new loans and the new interest and that can be sometimes very, very challenging. We will work out the modalities in due course. As you know, these plans were put together in a very short period of time because we want to give the uh, clarity to the markets but we would work out a scheme whereby we could provide that clarity as to how this would be implemented, but we are committing the funds so that we can provide that comfort to those businesses that are going to be over a period of next few months having to now grapple with the need to be paying back 
those loans that they had taken, as well as the loans for which they have already got a moratorium for. So that would be something that we would be doing. And during that period, uh, we would put an emergency lending facility framework in place. We would immediately suspend the Parate execution. We would like to banks to follow that and the forced rep reposition of leased assets up to 31st of March 2022 for the next six months because we, we are recognizing that special circumstances has made it uh, imperative that we provide that space and during that period we would like the banks not to go through that process but to have other methods to persuade the payment but not to resort to that. We would be implementing a comprehensive plan to deal with the six failed finance companies and actively pursue the revival of those could be revived with new investment. We will also ask all banks to have post-COVID revival units because there will be special problems that those businesses will encounter. We have to ensure that those businesses survive and we would want the banks to hold their hand, work through these difficult periods so that those businesses can survive beyond the COVID pandemic. We would revive the governance and share ownership rules and we would stop the multi-exchange rates taking place in banks. We have seen that happening, the multi-exchange rate. We have seen the banks, some banks, uh, uh, they follow what is, paid, what is specified by the central bank. But we have been told that between exporters and importers, there are other transactions that also take place at different rates of exchange. We have, in writing, I think the previous governor has mentioned that to the, uh, to the uh, banking sector, we would like to see that being adhered to. And that those who do not adhere to will be in, in uh, they'll be flouting a direction and we wouldn't like to see that happening. And we would like to see the banks following that and encourage all dealings to be within the normal transparent methods that are already introduced and not to have any other types of transactions outside that realm. We would make sure that the expeditious consolidation of the non-bank financial sector would occur. I've already mentioned to you about the six failed finance companies and a comprehensive plan. And we would like to see that finish by the 31st of March, 2023. We'll work on that deadline. I think these are complex issues, but even complex issues sometimes have simple answers. So we have to work on the complex issues. We'll improve the payments and settlements platform. Uh, we are in a digital age, and in that sense, the payments and settlements will need to keep pace with what is happening in the rest of the world. So we would be uh, engineering the systems within the central bank uh, that, of course, will be done during the six months as well, but it will probably move beyond that period to ensure that the money is being, uh, being uh, in circulation uh, would have new methods of uh, payments and settlements as well. We expect the banking sector to uh, ensure that they set up the revival units, as I mentioned, and also particularly to consider a new financing model to support equity participation as well. We have had some discussions with several banks uh, and we are trying to develop models where new debt is not burdened upon borrowers, those who have reached difficult periods as a result of the pandemic and otherwise, they need to be supported with new instruments as well. Adding debt to debt is not normally the way to go. Share market and the debt markets, we would like to see them having a plan which would take the Sri Lanka's equity markets as well as the debt markets to at least 50% of the rate of the, of the GDP. And that's something that we would like to see the stock exchange and the SCC working towards. You can uh, work with the other agencies of government as well. And that way, we would be able to see new avenues of capital coming into the country, which can spur development as we go along. Now let's look at the last item, which is the macroeconomic stability concerns. First of all, the government, we understand the government has a very tricky as well as a very complex balancing act to perform. Government always has that, but in this particular period of time, 
as a result of the pandemic and the attendant charges on the overall government's budget, that has been even more complex. So I believe the next budget will be uh, exercise which will have to be <coughs> dealt with very carefully. And I believe the government is already taking the necessary measures to ensure that that is addressed in that, in that fashion. A credible debt management strategy will be worked out. We already have given enough uh, material for that. And our debt, uh, debt management will be done in such a way that Sri Lanka will not face any difficulty whatsoever. That's why I want to, at this stage itself, uh, tell the stakeholders that we have no intention of going and asking any others for advice, although we can have technical advice from them in different areas. We have a team here which is uh, talented, which have gone to the best universities of the world. They have got experience, and I believe that kind of expertise is sufficient for Sri Lanka to deal with the current issues. So uh, I want to make that very clear that Sri Lanka will rely on the in-house expertise that we have. We have trust and faith and confidence in those experts and we work with those experts. We are also open to outside elements who can give us advice. We have a financial system stability committee. We have a monetary policy consultative committee. All those committees are comprised of people of repute who provide the Sri Lankan Bank with that advice. We listen to that advice, we take that advice, and you can be assured that having heard all that advice, we would be creating our own plans, like what we have done today, to go forward. So you can be sure that it is, these are not ad hoc measures, these are carefully thought through measures, which we believe will take us into the path of development as well as stability very, very quickly. We would work towards extending the average time to maturity of our debt stock, and we would work towards improving the doing business indicators as well. We have had some very good experiences in the past where we improved the debt, uh, where we improved the doing business indicators. We would revisit those and improve that so that we can have a system where Sri Lanka will be a preferred destination as far as investors are also concerned. The law for the Colombo Port City Commission provides ample space for those who are doing business to come into the Sri Lankan space and do business. And we would use that as a support for our new thinking as well. And we would use that for the future in the normal course of uh, other businesses as well. A comprehensive directory of physical investment opportunities has already been prepared by the government, uh, for which we are very pleased and happy about and we would like investors to make use of that as well so that they could be uh, making use of those opportunities. The central bank also has uh, fairly uh, tight as well as very uh, extensive uh, to-do list with regard to macroeconomic stability concerns as to how we are dealing with it. We would ensure the maintenance of mid-single digit inflation, stability in exchange rates and uh, exchange rates and interest rates, continue the steps that are being taken to, to curb the prohibited pyramid schemes and other financial scams, strengthen the central bank's balance sheet with a gradual rollback measure and a buildup of external reserves, introduce directions on IT risk resilience, strengthen the offside surveillance, increase the frequency and modes of public awareness. We see a lot of scams that are taking place and we want to keep the public posted of those scams so that they will also be aware that these are matters that they should guard against. Uh, launch a green financing facility. We are providing a space within the SRR, the statutory reserve ratio as well, for those who are uh, having funds being brought in for this kind of purpose. Strengthen regional development activities. Develop new regulations on financial consumer protection. Uh, sometimes we do hear uh, certain institutions uh, not uh, adhering to those regulations, so we want to bring some uh, teeth into the financial uh, consumer protection. The, have a friendly online submission of uh, uh, complaints to the central bank. 
established credit counseling centers. Already we have one at Rajakiriya, but we want to expand that further. Uh, set up, uh, help to set up the equity funds. Discontinue the cash margin deposit requirements on the non-essential and non-urgent, as I mentioned to you already. And consider the possibility of buying back some of these bonds that are trading at very high uh, discounts. We find that some of the ISBs uh, are trading at discounts, but when uh, a large chunk is sought after, that's not possible to buy. So the Sri Lankan bonds are being announced in these markets at very high discounts, which is not the case in actual fact, because many other investors have faith in our country. They hold on to our bonds till maturity, and you can be sure that their faith has not been in any, in any way uh, not honored by Sri Lanka, and we will continue to do that. So we would ask them uh, sometimes to examine these uh, quotations with a little more care, because sometimes I know they have to announce their balance sheets uh, at mark-to-market -market numbers, but this, that alone is not good enough of a reason to uh, sell off Sri Lankan bonds because we know that those have actual value and we would like those investors who have been with us, who have been with us over the last maybe 12 years to understand that Sri Lanka has the intention as well as the plans, as well as the desire to make those payments and we would like them to keep that in mind very carefully before you sell off any of your bonds. On the monetary front, the priorities will be maintaining the inflation at the targeted band. The monetary policy report we will be announcing uh, on a, with greater clarity and there will be a publication as well. The central bank has observed in the recent past that there has been certain bubbles being formed, particularly in the motor industry, the motor vehicles, and that's something that we would like to see addressed. And uh, the loan to value sometimes may be specified. I'm not a great fan of uh, specifying those uh, numbers as uh, ratios, but uh, sometimes if it is needed, we will do that. But we would ask the banks and the financial institutions to also examine their risk profiles carefully to ensure that those are given uh, proper attention when those are being done. We would uh, also, uh, as I mentioned, uh, provide some uh, support to the green options. Regional development will be, uh, initi initiatives will be continued to be promoted. Uh, I already mentioned to you about the growing menace of uh, prohibited schemes. Those have to be dealt with, as well as other schemes like people being told that they have just won a car or they have just won a million dollars. And to get that, that you have to pay some uh, upfront fee. And a lot of people get fooled by those, so not to get fooled. And the central bank spends a lot of money in uh, creating awareness about these things, but yet uh, awareness is not uh, sufficiently drilled down, and we are hoping that that also would occur. And <clears throat> we would carefully guide the stakeholders to tide over the pandemic uh, difficulties. And I want to uh, come to the final stages of this presentation by saying we would be outcome oriented. We are not merely setting out the plan. We would have a dedicated team of those who are involved in this process to ensure that these deliveries are done. I'd like to give you a summary of what we have uh, said so far. I'll make it a little brief and uh, point oriented so that it will be easy to, for people to uh, absorb. One, intervene in the forex market by providing the funds to finance the country's energy bills and thereby to infuse liquidity. Two, promote investments in rupee denominated government securities with a guarantee on the exchange rate. Three, strengthen mandatory conversion of export proceeds. Four, request the government to tax profits of exporters at 28% and not 14% where Forex is not repatriated and converted. Of course, within the limits that have been specified. Five, expand the moratorium while also providing liquidity support to affected finance companies. Stop parate executions and reposition of vehicles in the next six months for pandemic affected borrowers. Seven, share the burden of pandemic losses suffered by local SMEs by allocating rupees 15,000 million towards interest accrued through a mechanism which is to be worked out. 
Eight, use monetary policy tools to unwind monetary stimulus extended during the pandemic. Nine, use macroprudential tools as well as macroprudential regulation and supervision to guide the financial sector towards sustained stability. Ten, facilitate education and health-related forex outflows immediately. We know that a lot of people have had some difficulties about uh, taking money for various educational purposes as well as health-related purposes. We will facilitate that immediately so that that problem wouldn't occur for the future. Lift the ceiling imposed on outward investment and migration allowance effective from January 22. Already the regulations have been framed and issued. That's why we are not changing that for the time being. But no sooner that those regulations are completed by December 2021, we will not renew those, but we would allow that to happen so that those conditions could provide those who are migrating with the space for them to take out uh, their money at the time that they want to take it out. Discontinue the cash margin deposits requirements on non-essential and non-urgent imports. We know that several people have been undergoing various uh, difficulties as a result that would be lifted from today. Establish, uh, I remember the Prime Minister himself mentioned that this should be done, and I believe there has been a, a lot of people who have been affected by that. Although it did serve the purpose at the time that it was imposed, and then it did have the necessary uh, support for the balance of payments at that time, we believe now with the current inflows that we are envisaging, as well as the, the steps that we are taking, we would be in a position to relax that with immediate effect. We would establish the International Transactions Reporting System to monitor foreign exchange transactions commencing on January 1st, 22. Monitor services related foreign exchange inflows and ensure due repatriation and conversion. 15. Replace maturing debt obligations with new inflows through non-debt sources wherever possible. <coughs> 16. Consider the possibility of buying back the entire issue of ISPs maturing in January 22 and July 22 if high discounts are prevalent continuously. 17. Replace maturing ISPs with government-to-government -government loans until ISPs to GDP percentage declines to 10% or less. 18. Take measures to improve the sovereign ratings. 19. Strengthen workers' remittances through official channels. And 20. To restore licenses of money changes. So that's our uh, our own obligation and the duties that we have taken upon ourselves and we would fulfill that. Towards the end of 22, we would be able to approach the economy of the country with much greater confidence than what we have. We would see the results of what we are doing today. We would see the benefits of the cooperation that we are today appealing to everyone to provide because if we do it on, that, on those lines, we would find that each one's role becomes much easier to do handle. So our role would be to ensure that all stay on the path and that if any persons are in any way moving in a different direction to gently nudge them and to get them on track. And we would also commit ourselves to those numbers as well as those plans with the greater dedication uh, because of the fact that we have to deliver for, the, for this uh, nation to prosper and go forward. This is a dynamic plan. It is one that is uh, having different variables. All these variables need to be balanced one with the other. Sometimes it's a tough call to balance all these different variables. So we would sometimes tweak it. We will sometimes change it. We will sometimes have uh, to take additional measures to stay on course. But that's the best part of plans, that you must have a guiding plan in front of you and you will have different strategies that you would use to put you on target to move forward. So that's the commitment that I want to give all of you, and together we will succeed. Thank you very much.